Hello, Monsters Abound here, and welcome to Total War Pharaoh. And this video is going to be talking about one of what I think is the most interesting things about Total War Pharaoh, and that is the legacy system. So this system is basically a way to provide factions with more customization, effectively. I will say uh, there are six in total. One of them is really, really good, and the others are sort of middling. But it's a step in the right direction. So about turn, I want to say 12, you'll get the option to be part of either the Egyptian court or the Hittite court. Depending on which you pick, you'll get different legacies you can select. There are four Egyptian and two Hittite. We're going to start looking at the Egyptian legacies. If there's a specific one that interests you, there will be time co codes down below because I'm just that good to you. I, I am a generous god. Dif different period, but that, that's fine. Anyway, so we're going to start off with Thutmose the Conqueror. Thutmose the Conqueror is all about taking cities. Well, a city. City by city, effectively. So, this is a military legacy, and to do this, we need to prepare to conquer a pillar of civilization. These are the specific cities on the map, which, if you don't have visibility of them, are donated by the little ring. Um, they are the ones that sort of dictate uh, how the how the civilization's doing. So you can only conquer those cities using this. Other cities, and there's quite a few of them, you can't use this on. But still, you can use it to conquer pillars of civilization, which is something. And as we've seen in other videos about Civil Warfare, sieges in Total War Pharaoh are quite brutal. And if these pillars of civilization are going to be particularly difficult to take over, maybe this could be quite useful. Using this, you gain native support from locals or sabotage or a bit of both. You can pay uh, for an action against a city once per turn. Native support will leave the city happier after you take it, but sabotage will let you take resources from the city when you conquer it. So if you use all the actions, you unlock a culmination against the city. Use your, uh, use your built-up advantage to overwhelm the odds to take it and then pick a new city to do it again. So basically, you pick a city, spend a bunch of gold, take the city, and then do the next one. So we're going to select this legacy. And here is the legacy window. So effectively, what we have to do is we have to select a target. And here are all the cities we can use this again. As you can see... Literally, where where Ramesses starts here, they are there are no cities. You cannot pick any cities to do with that one. Um, you can pick different cities dependent on the the faction, and or you can just click on the option there, and whichever one you select, you can then pick that. So we will pick Ashkelon, Ashkelon, Ashkelon. There we go. We're going to pick Ashkelon. Um, in my campaign that I'm playing, I took this with an auto resolve, which means that. You know, spending all these resources on taking that city probably would have been a waste. But, you know, it, it's fairly early game. So, to initiate the contest, it's going to cost 100 gold. So, this is quite heavy on the gold cost. Um, each action will cost gold to do, usually around 100 to 250. Um, gold is no longer a limited or mineable resource in Total War Pharaoh, by which I mean that it will never run out, right? Stone runs out, gold doesn't. So if you take a gold settlement, it will always produce gold. I've not checked the gold settlement, but I think it's pr you probably, because, let's face it, gold ran out in Total War Troy, usually around turn 50, you're probably going to have a lot more gold than um, you would have had in Total War Troy. So we initiate... Bosh, there we go, and then we can do a conquest action. So you can do a conquest action each turn. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven conquest actions we can perform. And so we get different ones. And this is different each time. So once you've selected one and unlocked the next ones, that you'll then be able to select the next one, but you don't know what you're going to get until you do it. So the, the red ones, donated by the little red jewel here, are sabotage. Um, objectives and the blue ones donated by the little blue gem there are native support the red ones will mostly be things like reducing siege time or destroying walls or that kind of thing native support will generally provide you with reinforcements that will turn up on the battlefield to assist you in taking the city 
So in this option, we can pick attack the water supply, which will reduce the hold the, the siege holdout time by minus two and increase fatigue buildup. Alternatively, we could also sabotage and get the uh, siege holdout time reduced by three, and it will reveal the enemy garrison, but that will cost us 150. Alternatively, we can hire a native champion, which will provide us with some slingers, should we pick, and that's 100. So at this point, I think, now, depending on the rank, so the number of the number of options you pick will donate what bonuses you get. So for example, if you go with five sabotage, then you will get 150 stone, 150 bronze, and more replenishment for the army once you've captured the city. Alternatively, native support will provide you with more happiness, so plus 10 once you take the city, but this will also provide you with additional reinforcements as well. So if we pick the first one, for example, that provides us with some slingers, but it'll also provide us with two of these axe lads as well. So we'll pick that one. We increase the conquest alignment. Get a little doobie one along the way. And uh, once we get the conquest culmination, we can, well, I guess do the thing. I I'm assuming that at any point you attack the city, you'll still get the bonuses, but I could be wrong. So we're now a turn further ahead and we can select the second option. Um, these will tend to cost slightly more gold, but will be slightly more powerful. Uh, so again, we can find a route at night. We can rouse some native warriors or follow enemy patrols. Now we've already got some native support. Um, I might actually go with a little bit more, like more speed maybe, more morale. Hmm, I'm gonna go with that one. So we're gonna increase our native support. And of course this is still costing us gold, which we don't currently have any bonus for so we don't have any income for gold we're working on that not to worry though so we've completed the conquest which means we now have uh the locals fight beside you so flattery will get you everywhere including the hearts and minds of the native warriors which means in battle we will get almost an entire extra stack to reinforce us that's quite nice isn't it blessed by the gods Ever that means we can now attack the city Will yield. We have them cornered. And we will have an entire stack of reinforcements to come and help us. And once we've taken the city, they must surrender. We can do it all again. However, I say that is quite a steep gold cost to take a city. And did we really need that to take the city? Probably not. I probably just spent like 800 gold for no particular reason. And uh, that is kind of the problem with that legacy, in my opinion. It's it's fine, but I wish it was kind of like bonuses to maybe attacking an entire faction for maybe a set amount of turns. Like maybe if it had a gold upkeep and you could give yourself bonuses to fighting a specific faction, that would feel kind of like would make more sense. Taking one city after another is nice in theory, but let's say you take that city and then, well, what if we don't actually need to take another city for a little while? I mean, the nearest, like, if, if, we, if we were heading north, the nearest settlements we could take are these two up here. So why would we need... Yeah, so interesting, uh, but probably not the most useful of legacies. But that's fine, because, you know, there's a bunch of other ones. The second of our legacies is Hatsep the Merchant. It's the Merchant. So the Merchant will allow us to prepare trade expeditions to reach different, distant Dadar. Load your cart with trade items from your treasury and celeries from your characters. Pick a good destination where your items are in demand. Go to as many bazaars as you choose before returning the expedition home to reap the rewards. So, how does this work? Well, much like the, the caravan mechanic in Warhammer this is about sending caravans to different locations on the map now you have how many turns it's going to reach there you also have what they're going to offer and what they're interested in in return so we produce stone blocks and figs so I mean at the moment I'm actually hemorrhaging both of those but if I would say um stone blocks is anyone if I get right so, they... I want something they value. So I want someone who values stone. Like... Trying to find... Literally... Here we go. So these guys value stone. So if I load up... 
my I'm I'm you know just as an example we're going to send 1600 stone I'm also going to send a med j bow and the idea is that what we can do is we can go to this place which is going to take four turns we can sell these items and because they value them we can then buy some stuff that maybe they want to sell cheap so it says the items value here is one in fact i'm gonna i'm gonna send a bunch of stuff i'm gonna send that as well um sure let's do that that let's do that yeah okay let's go with that yeah we're gonna send the expedition there we go so the expedition is away that's gonna take four turns and while that is happening well we, we wait so, four turns later, and our caravan has reached its destination in Upper Egypt. So we can enter the bazaar here, and we can in fact sell our resources. And you can see that was green, so we're going to get extra resources for that. And we can pick up other things, so for example... Will not be my fate. Indeed. We could, like, get an Egyptian craftsman, so this would actually be a bonus for a province. We could dump that on a province, that could be quite useful. Uh, more stone income. Well, considering we just spent stone income, doesn't seem that useful. We could get uh, Dijendi, the rope maker. He can be turned into ancillary or can be used as a provincial effect. So that's an option. Uh, we could potentially get some, like, lumber. So that's only going to cost us 10. That's a hundred. There's only two of those. Um, I mean, we could we could sell all of this. So we've got a hundred. We've got, got one hundred and fifty income from that. So we could potentially like get some. That's food. So we could get six food. Court would be unwise to overlook me. Let's get the Egyptian craftsman as well. And let's get something like one of those. Is there anything for ten? A couple of those. Yeah. So, now we want to find somewhere that, va like this one, this one here. So this, this values... No, that's, that's what it offers. What I want is something that values that. Or the gold. The gold would be good too. What's that? Bronze weapons. So they value... So we could... So we could send our expedition here. And basically try and wheel and deal and all that kind of good stuff. And the idea is that you kind of do as much wheelie dealy as you can. Trade some bits and pieces, which I'm not very good at, to be fair. And uh, then you can bring it all home. Ideally with, you know, a caravan full of crap that you can then use to boost the rest of your empire. Which is quite nice. So we've arrived at our destination. We can... Sell all of those. Good stuff. I think I sold that by mistake. Never mind. Right, and then we could potentially, like, buy... So I think we sold our stone for 20, and it's here for 15. So we could actually, like, buy back our stone if we wanted. Um, there's granite blocks there. That's, like, quite a lot of stone income, which would be... Obviously quite useful. Uh, there's ancillary here, which gives upkeep reduction, which is quite nice. Libu tracker. I know so, so we could get um, more chance of ambush. And enemy armies get less movement on land. That would be quite nice. We could get more stone and bronze effect, potentially. It's quite nice. More stone income there as well. Uh, so, I mean, how am I feeling for food? I'm losing 1k food a turn. That's not great. That's that's not ideal, to be honest. In the grand scheme of things, I feel like it could be better. Uh, so let's get something like that. Let's do something like that. And then we will conclude our dealings, confirm that, and we're going to send it home. Future of Egypt. 
So our caravan has returned home, which means that we're going to get a whole bunch of resources, which is quite nice. So we can uh, get an ancillary, which is going to give us uh, gold upkeep and gold recruitment cross. I'm just going to turn that into gold. That's a gold. This guy is going to go... So he's going to boost up resources across the board. We're going to send him there. Um, we could... Ju oh, we're just going to take those as resources. That's fine. This guy is going to go there. That's fine. Um, we could reduce construction costs, but I'm going to take the granite blocks. That's going to give us 2,400 stone, which is actually massive. Like, genuinely amazing bonuses there. And uh, we get all this food as well, so that's 400 food across the board. And we can end the expedition, no, so that's going to give us 600 gold, 2,800 food, 2,400 stone, and 40 woods, along with some extra bonuses as well. And as soon as you've done that, you can send out another caravan. Now, this is going to give you a lot of resources, right? This is going to keep you going pretty much... As, as long as you need. It will give you everything that you need resource-wise to, to fund your armies, your empire, and everything else. It's genuinely one of the better legacies. Because you could do so much with it. So definitely worth a look if you're kind of like the wheelie-dealy stuff. And it's, it's not too difficult because even I can manage to make a profit on it. However, we now come to one of my favourites. Like, I'll go say it's, it's, it's my favourite legacy. It is the the Heretic. So the Heretic allows you to like mash gods together. So whereas you can up to, you can, I think you can worship up to three gods, but each of their bonuses are separate. So for example, if you build a shrine in one province, the shrine will be of one god, and the benefits you get from that god will only be in that province. Fine. Not a problem. I mean, you can mix and match because, you know, if you've got like a three settlement province, you can build a temple in each of them. However, what if you go, nah. What if you say, what I want to do is I want to take two gods and make them kiss. That's what the heretic's all about. So, the heretic. Now, you can take any two gods that you know. Uh, gods are, there's three gods in each in each province, and if you capture a settlement in a province with a different type of god, you will then know the god and be able to select it for worship. So, this group of gods, we can take any two of these gods, but there are, there are other gods, and you can, you know, mash those two together as well. So, for example, we could take Ra, because he is going... So, his shrines give more melee defense or recruitment and more workforce growth. His prayers give uh, more morale and more damage resistance to um, to the army. We can then select this guy. And this is then going to... Uh, there should be another bonus for um, for the army, which it isn't, doesn't seem to be showing at the moment. I'm not entirely sure why, because like you get a devoted general that gives more armor and more armor-piercing uh, melee damage. So we're going to select these guys here. We're going to create this one. There we go. It's devoted... Oh, because we need to reach tier 2 and we haven't got that. That's why it's not showing that. So... Basically, these powers are currently quite weak, but they will increase over time. This is the benefits we will get once we get to Tier 3. Getting to Tier 3 is not particularly difficult. Right, if you build a bunch of temples, all that kind of good stuff, it's not going to be difficult. So, at Tier 3, we're going to get a shrine. So, those are the outpost buildings. We'll get uh, 8 workforce growth, 12 happiness. So you could effectively not have to worry about building a happiness building in any of your cities. You could just leave your outpost shrines to do the work for you. It also means you get three melee defense on recruitment, plus two recruit rank on top of that. Construction cost for resource management and military support buildings is reduced by 45%. Labor cost for constructing bastring ram, siege towers, and uh, basic siege equipment for your armies. The enemy siege holdout time, morale for that army, and damage resistance is all increased by, well, massive amounts of percents if you pray at a shrine. And a devoted general gets more armor. His entire, well, his entire army gets more armor. He gets more armor-piercing melee damage, more melee attack, and more melee damage on top of that. Then... You get four additional bonuses on top of that when you hit the next. So this is, I mean, just the fact that you can take any of these two gods and just mash them together to create this, this brand new 
god effectively and then pile on additional bonuses on top of it is fucking amazing in my opinion i think it's just genuinely genuinely great so once we're happy with that we can oh, that's all that's that that right there we go right so so we need to reach two tier two to able to um to actually dedicate a uh, a general to a god but it's um it's just really good it's just genuinely really good um your generals just become powerhouses with that on because and because you can pick any two gods it means that if you are in a slightly different position on the map you might get access to different gods which will give you different options alternatively there is an option at the start of the game um, in the campaign options which allows you just to know all the gods anyway so if you were going this method maybe you want to go that to give you the, the, the you know the the biggest options the biggest amount of options you can select from any god there and mash them together just generally i i, I love i love being able to have customization i love the customization and i think that is really really good i think total war pharaoh is a step in the right direction in giving the the player more customization it's stuff that i love when it's in warhammer when you have mechanics things like the um the clan molder like build your bear type mechanic i like that um there's a few other factions we have so i i love that shit because it just means you can make your faction the way you want and i think that's really fun and i think all of these legacies are good but i think that what i love about this legacy is the fact that it gives customization within customization it's really really good and in fact this is a legacy that i'll be using in my i say full campaign my 50 turn campaign of total war pharaoh so if you like the look of this check that out too the last of the Egyptian legacies is the Builder, which allows you to build monuments. So, monuments can be built at unique outpost sites. Construction is separated in stages and starts with a foundation. Protect your wonders by hiring a garrison as, as soon as construction starts. So does the world. Good. Be prepared to defend them at all times. Other factions will try to attack them. To speed up construction, use province supply and experts. Once complete, wonders will empower all of Egypt, increasing your legitimacy. Fine. So, the the locations of each monument differ. So, uh, the Great Pyramid is down there. The Great Gardens over there. The Black Obelisk down here. And finally, the Mortuary Temple is over there. But, we do have one that starts near us. We have the Colossal Statues, which is over here. So... It's currently got an Egyptian lookout post on that, so we need to knock that down first. Um, once we've done that, we can start construction on our monuments. I will prove my worth. Go uh, good. So now we've knocked down that outpost, we can now construct the colossal statues. To do that, we are going to need certain resources. So we have to construct the foundation, and then each of the steps once we've done that it will give us certain benefits Surely this empire will last a thousand years well maybe so it's going to give us more morale faction wide for elite pharaoh units it's going to give us 10 legitimacy four victory points 10 percent melee attack for elite pharaoh units and armor piercing missile damage for elite pharaoh units in return, it's going to cost 4,000 stone to build a foundation along with 12 turns, but we can reduce that if we construct a stone mine. That will reduce it by 2,000, effectively halving the amount we need. Then we need some statue crowns. That's going to cost another 2,000 stone, although we can turn that into 1,000 if we have a lumber reserve. Statue paint is going to cost 5,000 food, although we can reduce that if we get a Bazaar of the Arts. And the soldier quarters is going to cost 2,000 wood, so many, although again, we can reduce that. However, all in all, assuming you don't have any of those bonuses, it's going to take 6,000 stone, 5,000 food, and 2,000 wood. If you do have the bonuses, then it's only going to take 3,000 stone, 2,500 food, and 1,000 wood. Still, quite a lot of resources. Not to mention the fact that it seems to state that the, your enemies will be gunning for it, and uh, you're going to have to leave a garrison there to protect it. 
The wonder effects don't seem particularly great, at least on the colossal statues. I don't know if it's better for any of the other ones because you can't see them unless you start there. And frankly, I can't be bothered to go it through the randomization. Have finally so mastered civility. Good. Um, and, and to get the to get the special locations to be able to to build them, to be honest. So overall, that seems fine. Shall we see if we can start building stuff? I mean, twelve turns is quite a long time to you know spend building something. Um, but we do have currently some decent stone income, so you know we, we can we could work on it. Okay. I've got enough stone, and I've built the stone mine, which means it's reduced it by 2,000, so I can build that. And what? Add units to get... What the fuck? Oof. Uh... What? Oh, I see. I have to pick a garrison. I can pick... Oh, so you have to spend food for it. Court would be unwise to overlook me. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Okay. So I can... Do that and assign experts. I don't have any experts, but okay. So that's going to take 12 turns to finish. And then I can spend more stone on adding some statue crowns, I guess, because we must build the foundations first. I'm wondering if you can build these at the same time afterwards. I genuinely don't know. Okay, well, I tried. I got within three turns, but I'm literally hemorrhaging food to the point where I can't defend myself and uh, everything's fucked. So I guess the answer is maybe you can build these at the same time and maybe they do something different. But the real main thing, I think, is that the actual benefits for doing this seem like really bad considering the time and resources you need to do this. It feels like a massive expenditure of resources for very little in return. I go so far as to say it's like the opposite of the of the trader legacy, whereby you get a shit ton of resources from that, whereas this just kind of consumes resources. I guess it does give you some like legitimacy and stuff, which might come in useful, but you know you can probably get that otherwise. Yeah. Anyway, the Hittites come with two. Legacies, the Benevolent and the Overseer. The Benevolent is all about keeping your vassals and subjects happy and letting their gratitude strengthen you. So, keep the happiness of your regions high and stay in good relations with your vassals. Their gratitude will accumulate over time. The higher gratitude climbs, the better the courtesy rewards will be. You can use tokens of gratitude for a variety of bonus to your settlements, your armies and your position in court. Gather tokens over time and spend when it's most necessary. So this is fairly straightforward. If you have vassals, then obviously they'll give you gratitude. Um, your own people will also increase your gratitude. And this will increase this little pool here. Currently we have 50. You kind of start off with 50 so you can spend a few bits and pieces. But you can do things like um, get expert builders. So uh, this will give you... What's it do? It's like bonuses to like settlement construction, I think. Skilled blacksmiths will give you like um, ancillaries and equipment and stuff. Hidden informants will allow you to see the whole terrain or whole sort of like empire of a faction. Uh, court attendance gives you a court action, so you can buy that one. And then final, finally, battle potency will give you the effect tempered by war so for example we could buy one of those one of those and maybe do that as well maybe do that twice and what that means and this, in this little campaign i started uh, i did the random start position so i actually stand started up here you can see settees up here somewhere and uh, there's a whole bunch of, basically it just, it just like upends the board and it gives you a random bunch of random this provinces which is which is quite interesting year. So what this has done for us is basically we can f we can rush any building thanks to our construction thingy magic, so we can rush that building there. Uh, we've also got an Apis shield and an Egyptian sword, short sword from getting those bonuses, and the all of our rest. armies will have the ex they'll have the, uh, the veterans of war, which basically gives them more uh, experience in battle, so they'll get twenty five percent additional experience in the turn that we get that. I mean, it's a fairly straightforward legacy. It's it's fairly basic. You know, if you have vassals, obviously that's going to increase your gratitude. The more gratitude you have, the better the benefits have, and you can store these up and use them when you need to as well. So, generally, quite.
quite useful, not particularly exciting, but quite useful. Finally, we have the Overseer. The Overseer is kind of a bit weird. It gives power to your generals by elevating them to princes. So you can select characters to become uh, Hatai princes and unlock special titles for them. In addition to powerful effects, princes titles increase competencies. Give each prince the privilege of managing a vassal. The prince's titles effects will be improved. A prince can hire native units from the territory of the vassal they manage and win battles with the prince to increase relations with their managed vassal. So, currently we don't have any spare generals, but we can just recruit one. So we'll go and pick anyone, doesn't really matter who. You will do. My name will be Legend. Noted. Right, so we can recruit you. You then can, ass so you can assign him a vassal. Uh, I don't quite know how that works because I've not been able to get a vassal. Um, but you can give him these special titles. So you have uh, six special titles, give you various different bonuses. So for example, uh, additional movement and more ardor. You can get uh, an increased ancillary chance and legitimacy from battles, uh, recruitment slots and recruitment cost. You can get XP per turn, upkeep reduction, fortitude, influence and happiness in the province, or presence, XP per turn and upkeep reduction for tier four units. And I mean, that is overall Fine, I guess. My question is, I know you can recruit like native units from the vassal you're managing, but does that increase the title? Because the if gods, if the idea is to like empower, you know, six of your generals with really nice titles, then I mean, yeah, these titles are fine, I guess. I mean, I wouldn't really say that they're massively game changing. They're nice, but you know, meh and i feel bad about saying that but yeah i mean basically meh it's it's very very limited and out of all of the legacies i think this is probably the worst one in that it just feels like the most boring one um which is a shame um i wish that maybe your titles improved maybe if the titles were dependent on what type of vassal like every faction in the game had a particular title that you could like vassalize it with kind of the like a pokemon you could collect them all and maybe the higher your relations with that vassal the better the title was something like that right your title started off quite weak but if you got like you know 100 additional relation that would then you know that at that point you're really trying to manage your your vassals to make them as happy as possible but then that's maybe more the benevolent i don't know but i feel like that's just like the most boring one it doesn't really do much for you it's pretty forgettable um you pretty much forget that it, it kind of, you know, exists for the most part, which is a shame because I feel like the legacies are a really interesting part of Total War Pharaoh. Anyway, that was all of the legacies. Hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.